Hello, I'm Lydia Talbot. Welcome to Sanctuary. On today's program, we tell an intriguing story of Chicago religious broadcast history. WCFC TV 38, once the largest independent Christian television station in America, was broadcast live from the Hancock Building in the era before the advent of cable television and the internet. Sanctuary producer Tim Frakes brings us this personal retrospective on a broadcasting phenomenon that touched the lives of thousands here in Chicago and around the nation through syndication. It's a story that will challenge what you think about your politics and your faith today on Sanctuary. WCFC TV 38 was, in some ways, a typical television station. Cameras, studios, sets, lights, videotape machines, a master control, offices, but in other ways, more profound ways, WCFC TV 38 was different. The call letters WCFC stood for Winning Chicagoland for Christ. At the time, TV 38 was the largest independent Christian television station in America and part of an emerging trend that saw the rise and public fall of famous televangelists like Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart, the emergence of the religious right on the conservative political landscape, and a mainstreaming of the American Pentecostal movement. He begins to fight, but then we find ourselves back on our knees saying, Oh Lord, help me please. And in more subtle ways, TV 38 also nurtured a grassroots ecumenical movement that crossed ecclesial, racial, and economic barriers that had divided Christians in Chicago for decades. When I'm depressed or anything, I put channel 38 on and I get over it, and I think it's a wonderful channel. We wanted to let you know that the kids especially appreciate the cartoon shows in the afternoon and Saturdays. Because TV 38 was an independent television station operating on a shoestring as a nonprofit with non union labor, WCFC was free to create a vast array of local programming, many of which were then syndicated nationally, including an influential gospel music program, Saturday Night Sing, an exercise program, Shape Up with Nancy Larson, Bible Baffle, a Christian game show. Young at Heart, a Southern Gospel music program, Solid Rock Video, which covers Christian contemporary music, an elaborate live-action children's puppet program featuring Ringling Brothers face clown Leon McBride called Toddler's Friends, and dozens of documentaries and other local programs. It was all broadcast live on television, and I had a front row seat. The electronic church was really a culmination of decades of uh, evangelical and conservative Protestants' uh, attempts to try and uh, reach out to their culture that had centered on broadcasting. Following World War II, a new medium, television, emerged as a growing phenomena that changed American culture forever. Roman Catholic, Evangelical Protestant, Protestant mainline, and especially Pentecostal Christians, quickly recognized the potential of the new medium and began to create programs. From his limbs and heal him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. 
The advent of television coincided with a great healing revival in American Christianity. What became uh, increasingly obvious to these conservative Protestant broadcasters was they did not have an equal access to airtime as did their more mainline, mainstream Protestant uh, rivals. So what they had to do was uh, create their own broadcast environments and often that entailed chaining together a number of different stations and uh, in sort of uh, independent broadcasts and then raising funds from their listeners. So by the time the 1970s roll along they had sort of honed this into an art. Fulton Sheen, the uh, Catholic priest, was with the penetrating eyes was about all there was on, <clears throat> on television along with the Billy Graham Crusades from time to time. But I'd say by the mid to late 70s, that's when you'd, you really started to see more of the local pastor, whether it was Bob Schuler out in Garden Grove or Jerry Falwell at Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, and then some of the more, let's just say, flamboyant uh, types. I was in UHF television in Dallas. We were trying to make UHF television working. I mean, we gave away thousands of, of rabbit ears in that little circle just so, you know, you can go to a 7-Eleven store, you could pick up, you know, get them for free because we're just trying to get people to watch. And many of those stations didn't make it. And that was the advent of Christian television. I was pastoring in Alton, Illinois had been there four years, but I had a burden for Chicago land, and then I got a call from Stone Church. Well, Owen Carr was born in 1923 in Oklahoma. He became a pastor, an Assemblies of God pastor at a pretty young age. Uh, he began in the ministry at, in 1942. He didn't have any uh, Bible college education, but he had a call of God on his life. By 1970, Owen Carr had moved to suburban Chicago and accepted a call to become the pastor of Stone Church. The Stone Church grew out of the Pentecostal or Azusa Street revival that began in California in 1906. The revival spread to Chicago where the congregation known as the Stone Church began. In 1968, Stone Church built a new building in suburban Palos Heights and became a focal point for a charismatic renewal that coincided with the social, radical, and political upheaval that was sweeping the nation. The Stone Church, after its early heydays, when Owen Carr took the pastorate, they only had about 350 people at the church. But Owen Carr really has a vision. He always has a vision, it seems, and has just a wonderful, winsome spirit. And he was able, in his six years in the pastorate, to build it from 350 to 1,000 people in Sunday morning attendance. As Stone Church grew, so did Owen Carr's vision for spreading the gospel. December the 19th, I came the first Sunday in August, so we're just in a few weeks. I was in the family room of the parsonage, weeping over the city. God, you love them, and Jesus, you died for them, and Lord, I care, but I can't tell them. How can I tell this many people that God loves them? And it was like a thought passed through my head. A television station would help, but I knew nothing about television. I, I didn't even watch television. So I sat down to read, and my Bible fell open to Isaiah 54. And I read, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Well, when television came to America, we lived on the plains of Kansas, and there were no towers out there. There were no towers anywhere. So they went out on the prairie and put up a tower. And when it got up so far, they put out cables, and when it went higher, they put out longer cables. And when I read, lengthen your cords, in my mind, I saw those cables. And when I read, strengthen thy stakes, I saw those concrete abutments they anchored to. I wouldn't say it was a vision, but I wouldn't say it wasn't either. And I just stopped, and I said, Lord, are you really trying to tell me something? 
As things began to percolate at Stone Church, the Chicago Federation of Labor, an umbrella organization representing a variety of local labor unions since the late 1800s, decided to sell its construction permit for a 5 million watt television UHF channel 38 WCFL TV. They needed a buyer. Back at Stone Church, Owen Carr had privately become convinced that God was speaking to him about television. And so I called a board meeting. I just unburdened my heart for the city and told them what God had laid on my heart. Eventually somebody asked, what will it cost? And I had no idea. I said, I don't know, maybe $10 million. And with that being the only figure mentioned, they voted unanimously to try for it. I had taken on a position here in Chicago in the John Hancock building. Around the corner from us, there was a new construction going on for a television station. It was um, going to be called WCFL Channel 38. And I got to know the engineer who was uh, doing the contracting work up there. And he uh, told me about the station, and they're going ahead, uh, but however, they're probably not going to be putting it on the air. Giving me some inside information that the WCFL, the management, was extremely worried because some of the other U's were not financially making it at that time. And he says they're probably just going to sell the construction permit. I then mentioned it to a manager of WYCA in Hammond, Indiana. He attended Stone Church and happened to mention to Owen Carr that this station may be coming available. I received the call and he introduced himself on the phone in the control room at Channel 26. And he said, hey, well, well, tell me about this uh, station that's going to be on the block. Da, 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 da. I told him. Armed with inside knowledge that a TV station was available in Chicago, Carr swore his staff and church board to secrecy regarding the vision and set out to develop a marketing campaign and set a date for announcing the idea to the congregation and wider community with fanfare, literally. The most exciting thing that's ever happened in the Stone Church and its history will happen on September the 30th on Sunday morning. We started that weeks ahead and uh, we unveiled what was called the city with no doors. There were about 700 people packed in. We had a trumpet trio prepared to blow a fanfare, and so they blew the fanfare, and we pulled back the velvet and uncovered the picture, and I started presenting it. And the trumpet trio was to blow a fanfare at every 10,000. Well, we had 10,000 almost immediately, and 20,000, and 30,000, and they, I don't think we heard two fanfares in the whole thing. They just got caught up in it. When we said 60,000, some lady said, you must be kidding. But we weren't. 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 20, 130, $135,000 in that offering. With seed money in hand and his church behind him, Carr's next move was to hire a recent Wheaton College graduate to work on publicity. Like Carr, Steve Warner knew next to nothing about television. I said, we need to find out what other people are doing. We can't reinvent the typewriter. But first of all, we frankly don't know what the typewriter is, so we can't reinvent it anyway. I booked a flight to Dallas, and I was going to go visit the Christian television stations there. When I got to Dallas, I mushered into the office of Jerry Rose, and when I came back and I wrote up my report, I remember I had this one line in there, that we've got a good manager down there in Dallas and he needs to be hired. So we invited Jerry to come meet with the board, and he said he wasn't interested. Owen knew absolutely zero about television. There was not one man on that board of directors who knew anything about television nothing. They didn't have any money. They didn't have any knowledge. Uh, all they had was the possibility of this incredible antenna owned by the Chicago Federation of Labor sitting up there. Months passed and I finally started praying, God, I need Jerry Rose. Would you send Jerry Rose? 
because I need somebody that knows Christian television. So send Jerry Rose, and I just prayed specifically. Rejecting Owen Carr's offer to come to Chicago, Rose returned to Dallas and accepted a position in Virginia Beach, Virginia, with Pat Robertson's Christian Broadcasting Network. Chicago, however, was still on the mind of Jerry Rose. And the Lord just was speaking to our heart, and I called him and I said, have you found anybody? And he said, uh, no, I have not. And uh, so I said, well, I'll, uh, you know, I'll keep thinking. We hung up. About five minutes later, he called me back. He said, is God saying something to you? And I said, you know what? Maybe he is. By the summer of 1974, a new not-for-profit corporation, Christian Communications of Chicagoland, was formed. A makeshift office was set up at Stone Church and Carr, the board, and its new vice president and general manager, Jerry Rose, launched into an exhaustive marketing and fundraising campaign, which culminated in the First National Bank of Evergreen Park, extending a $600,000 letter of credit. Combining the credit with donations from Stone Church and others, Carr and Rose made a non-redeemable cash offer of $25,000 in earnest money to purchase the transmitter and construction permit from the Chicago Federation of Labor for $850,000, millions of dollars less than the CFL's original asking price. While we were negotiating, their attorney had one problem. When he was really under pressure, his ears would get red. So I knew when I had him under pressure. <laughs> Now we go from a station that was worth maybe $4 million down to $2 million, and dynamically the same thing happened in terms of the sale as happens when a person has a house, they've got to liquidate and get out of there. The price kept going down. So God worked a miracle backwards. He didn't give us a lot more money. He just made it a lot less money we had to spend. So I reached a point where I said, I know $25,000 isn't a lot of money for you fellows, but it's a lot of money for us. And I laid the check on the desk and I said, uh, we would like to sign a contract on that. And uh, if I don't come up with the rest of it, we'll forfeit the $25,000. They huddled, they said, Reverend, you'd have to come up with at least another, and I was thinking million, two million. He said, $150,000. I said, well, I have some men on standby. I'll place a conference call. And I called and the treasurer said, I don't even have to pray about it, just sign the paper. We walked out of there and Jerry and I went downstairs and he said, well, we bought it. Now what are we going to do? <laughs> the clock began ticking. Now the proud owners of a transmitter and a construction permit for a 5 million watt UHF television station that covered Chicago, its suburbs, and as far east as Holland, Michigan, north to Milwaukee, and south to Peoria, Illinois, Christian Communications of Chicagoland had six months to raise an additional $400,000 above their $600,000 existing line of credit from their bank before the FCC would actually grant them a license. Having a channel without a license is equivalent to having a car without a license. You can't drive it. So I fly to Washington, and, and I've got a stack of little pieces of paper. Mrs. Jones from Palos Park says that if we get on the air, she will pledge $5,000. Uh, this family says that they would pledge $2,000. This family, and I felt like an idiot. I package all this up and I, I give it to them and they said, look, we'll look at it, we'll let you know. The next two days, I just walked around Washington, D.C. I, I didn't expect to be there that long. I think I had one suit. I expected to be there a day and go home, and it was like three days. And I'm praying, and I'm saying, God, you know, I don't, you know, please, what's what's happening? On the last day, I go to Mark Burfield's office, and I walk in, and uh, I said, "Have we heard anything?" And he just kind of stares at me a minute, and he hands me this little note. It, it said, "Chicago has been." Granted. On May 26, 1975, Christian Communications of Chicagoland received the call letters WCFC, Winning Chicagoland for Christ. Five days later, Memorial Day, 
TV38 was scheduled to go live on the air, except now they had no studio, no crew, no equipment, and no way to get the live signal up to the John Hancock and out through the transmitter. We were trying to sign on the air by the next Monday, and Owen said, you know, we'll be there, we'll be on the air. And I said, well, I don't know how. I said, the only thing I know is I can run the tape through your teeth and they can watch it in your eyes, because that's all I've got. Friday, before we were to go on the air on Monday, a couple of guys came to my office and said, we hear you're looking for studios. Yes, we are. Well, we have studios. Well, that was a misnomer, really. They had a warehouse with a black curtain stretched around the corner and some dilapidated equipment. In one frantic weekend, the team, that now included transmitter engineers Lex Young and Dave Osland, convinced the owners of Olympic Studios on Chicago's near west side to throw together a live production, which included the last-minute purchase of a time-based corrector and the miraculous discovery of a live cable feed from the studios to at and Central Switching Center and then up to the transmitter on the John Hancock Building. So we had invited uh, the banker and his staff and their companions and people from Stone Church and we'd signed up some prayer counselors and we invited them and their companions and there were about 125 people pouring in there. And these guys had worked all day and all night. I mean, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and into Monday and they're exhausted and mad and cussing. That night could only be described as mayhem Nothing was working out like we had thought. We had telephone counselors there, but they had no place to sit. Time is running out. People running around like chickens with their head cut off. And all of a sudden, a man comes over, grabs me by the shoulders, propels me across the floor and said, you stand right there. He came back with a big microphone, put it in my hand. And I said, what do I do with this? So he was trying to turn his Bible and, and use a handheld mic. And he went over by the camera, turned around, the red light came on, and he said, you're on the air. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Broadcast syndication played an important role in the story of WCFC TV 38. As TV38's programming engine revved up, the station's vision began to expand beyond Chicago. At the same time, paid daily syndicated programming from other Christian broadcasters eager to reach the Chicago market became an important revenue stream. Nightly programs like the PTL Club with Jim and Tammy Baker, Jerry Falwell's Old Time Gospel Hour, Pat Robertson's 700 Club, and Jimmy Swaggart accounted for a critical revenue stream for TV38. I have sinned against you, my Lord. In the mid to late 1980s, when a spectacular series of scandal, intrigue, and public disgrace toppled some of the biggest names in Christian television broadcasting, TV38 was faced with replacing thousands of dollars of predictable weekly revenue when those broadcasts were pulled from its program schedule. As TV38 expanded its programming outreach, new technologies like cable television, the shift from analog to digital broadcasting, and the emerging internet and World Wide Web spelled the end for Chicago's local Christian broadcast television station. Towards the end of the 90s, uh, we were seeing, I think, a great transition in uh, communication. When we started, if you want to watch anything on television, you had eight opportunities in Chicago. There was no cable, there was no internet, and they would dial to our station, and then they would have to go back and sit down, and then if they didn't like it, three minutes, four minutes later, they would get up and would go. But you had that much sampling for your programming, so you could get people into it. Uh, 22 years later, nothing moves but the thumb. In January 1998, Christian Communications of Chicagoland, Inc., the corporate expression of TV38, sold the transmitter and station license to Paxson Communications Corporation for a reported $120 million. Eventually, TV38 changed its name to the Total Living Network and moved out of the city of Chicago to the western suburbs and continued to create content distributed through cable television. 
I'm really grateful for my time at TV38. I'm happy they took a chance on me, a young kid with no production experience. I learned more at Channel 38 about television uh, than I've learned in all the years since. Those people that gave to TV38 and helped and prayed for TV38, those prayers and those efforts didn't go in vain. For those 22 years, whatever their involvement was, God used those people to affect people's lives. I thank God for the opportunity that I had uh, to work at TV38, to work with uh, some of the best people I've ever met in my life. When I look back on our years that we spent uh, working at TV38, from the very beginning on up till the present. I'm amazed at how uh, God's hand has been so clearly in this, that ministry. It was this joint struggle that we worked together to make these things happen. When you see something on the air or somebody walks up to you and say, you know, I, I saw that show last week. We realized that it, that it was impacting people and it was amazing to be part of something that was bigger than you were. One of the greatest experiences at, at TV38 was the number of talented, dedicated people who came through, really lovely people, many of whom are still my friends. To me, that experience of, there were really literally hundreds of people that came through that station. Well, I look back at the people that, talent and staff especially that we had, gosh, they've gone on to do great things. It became more, more than a ministry. It was a life. You know, people believed in this. Um, we didn't just think of this as a job. It was, it was, a, it was a ministry. The legacy of TV38 uh, made a, a great impression on a great number of people in Owen Carr's vision to reach the city. I think God put this together for a purpose and I, for a, a, a grand purpose during that time of the, when the power of Christian television was really making an impact. We're glad you've been with us today for this special edition of Sanctuary. Your thoughts and reactions to issues and ideas at the intersection of life and faith are important to us, and we want to hear from you. Email us at gcbm at ameritech.net, visit our website at gcbm.org, and write to us at Sanctuary in care of the Greater Chicago Broadcast Ministries 77 West Washington Street, second floor, Chicago 60602. That's Sanctuary, the Greater Chicago Broadcast Ministries, 77 West Washington Street, Chicago 60602. I'm Lydia Talbot. Thanks for keeping faith with us today on Sanctuary. May peace be with you. Thank you.